My name is Charles Malky, biologist and plant expert with Ivory Organics, where we grow cool plants. And today we have the honor and privilege of being here with Paul Roberts in Simi Valley, California, where he is a passionate fig grower for about 10 years now and has a lot of great knowledge um, to share both with myself as well as with you. Um, I've been a member of the California Rare Fruit Growers for about three years now, and I've come across a lot of knowledgeable people within the field but when it comes specifically to figs Paul is the go-to guy and um, and we're gonna learn a lot in this um, educational segment relating to fig care and specifically I wanted to start off talking about is there such a thing as a vegan fig and um, a lot of people are like troubled by the idea of like is there you know why would a fruit not be vegan figs automatically should be fruits and why would there be any animal part to a fig and um, and that's all related to the biology and the science that's behind the relationship with figs and the fig wasp, which apparently there's a couple um, types of fig wasps that live here in the Southern California climate. And the goal is to see if we can enjoy figs that are not tainted by fig wasp that are doing its thing within the fruit. And the goal is to get behind the science of that and we're gonna do that today with Paul. And um, oh, thank you. Thank you. Okay, so uh, speaking of veg, veg and figs, uh, in California, the thing you have to, uh, if you're concerned about this, the thing that you're looking for is the fig wasp, which is, you know, it basically lives in the fig. <laughs> so, you know, that you're going to have to take a look at. If you're uh, outside of fig wasp territory, which is pretty much everywhere else in the United States other than California, there, there might be some pockets that have been introduced uh, someplace. Uh, maybe Arizona or something, but I'm not aware of them. So uh, on the East Coast, uh, the fig wasp is not going to be a concern for you. Um, what I was hoping that we can discover and hopefully get answers <laughs> to, are there some varieties of figs that are vegan? Meaning, is there some varieties of figs that I can plant in my backyard, grow and they'll fruit, and I can know with certainty that there's no fig wasp in there? Is there such a thing? You know what? Not in California. In order to be certain that they, they, uh, you do not have fig wasps in there, you would have to uh, physically exclude them. Uh, be that through the organzi bags. Okay. Okay. The wasp is not necessary for the uh, the the figs to ripen in the common varieties. Okay. They are uh, they do not require caprification, and they will ripen up just fine. Uh, but in California. It gets kind of dicey as far as whether the fig is present or not. I have uh, uh, two figs here. I have a Ziti and an unknown pastulier that do require the, the fig wasp. Um, and I use them as a, my canaries in a coal mine to let me know, okay, what's the fig, status, fig wasp status here? Okay. okay, are they here this year? If they, if they, uh, if they drop, uh, uh, then I know that, uh, I know that the, the wasp doesn't have a presence here. Now, that can vary from year to year because I do not grow uh, Capri figs, okay? I'm figuring there's enough of them out there, and there might be one right there on the other side of that, that fence. Okay. But what happens is that because those uh, Capri figs, most people look at, that, look at them as a weed. So a lot of times they'll be out there and they'll be hacking away at the thing. So there was, there's no place for the wasp to live. And so if they let it grow uh, one year, and you can have caprified uh, smearing. And if they're out there hacking away at it, then uh, there's not gonna be any place for the fig wasp to carry on its uh, life cycle to be able to enter, say, a common fig. You've shared a lot of really important points in just the last few minutes. Um, I kind of want to go over them and, and kind of break down the points. The first okay. one being, you mentioned mm -hmm. Capri fig. And I know that there's four varieties of figs, and you said the Capri fig, for example, is in, for most people just a weed because it doesn't create fruit, but it does create edible fruit. Yeah. It doesn't create edible fruit, but it does have the male fruit necessary for the female fruit of another type of the four types of figs. Do you want to just go over what are the four varieties or the four categories sure. of figs? Okay, well, the one that most people are familiar with, and really, uh, you know, unless you're really uh, going to be a serious collector is a common fig. Okay, and a common fig could be anything like this Preto behind me, um, or the Vista, or 
they're very, very prevalent. Um, and they do not require caprification. They do not require the wasp. Some of them, uh, like the Vista there, will set a Breva, which is the first crop. And uh, usually on that tree, it's probably, mm, could be anywhere from late May to mid-June, where it will set the, uh, it'll set a Breva, Breva crop. And the Breva will, um, the fig will actually pop up before the leaf does, before it goes into the leaf. And it's really quite pretty. Uh, other stuff like this, the Preto, it'll put on a, it, it, for all practical purposes, it's useless as a Breva. It will it, occasionally drop a Breva, but they're, they're nothing, it's, I think I got, maybe seven breva in the last eight years off of this, and none of them were edible. They did not ripen properly, and they split. So the breva <laughs> crop, I mean, just for clarification, is the first crop, and then yes. the main crop is the summer crop. That's correct, and, yes. But you're saying the, um, the Prado is one of the common varieties of figs. It is a common they variety. They do it, not require pollination. Right. And it did fall in the same category as the other common figs you'd find at some of the big box stores are your Kadota figs, yes. the brown turkey fig, and the black mission fig. Those are all within the common varieties that, again, don't require pollination, also known as parthenocarpic fruits. Go. And how did you, um, you, just, you mentioned it earlier, how would you define a parthenocarpic fruit? I think it uh, means virgin fruit. Yeah, so it's yeah. a virgin fruit, a fruit that it does not a... require any honeybees, doesn't require the fig wasp, mm -hmm. doesn't require like any interference with the insect world in order to create fruit. Correct. Um, mm -hmm. And there's a variety of fruit trees that benefit um, and create fruits without the requirement of pollination. So we just talked about the common fig. That's one category of the four categories of figs. What are okay. the other three? <clears throat> okay, so you, you've got your uh, San Pedro. And San Pedro uh, sets a Breva with no caprification. Okay, so it's the, the Brevas will pop up and you do not need uh, a wasp. Now, uh, you do need a wasp for the, for the main uh, and uh, the main crop, which is gonna come later. And most people don't raise the Desert King for the main crop, they do it for the Breva. Uh, and a lot of that stuff, you're gonna, be, you're gonna see it grown in uh, the Northwest like Washington, Oregon, Vancouver, okay. you know. So for clarification, I got it. So the reason for the Breva crop is it's the fastest, it's the earliest crop. And also another uniqueness about the Breva crop is it will grow on last year's wood. So you got to be careful with pruning on your Breva if you're selecting for, for example, you said yes. Desert King is one variety Desert of this. Desert King is the most common. Of a San Pedro. So. Um, if that's the goal, you got to be careful how much you prune because depending on how much wood you have from last year, that's going to determine how much rubber crop you have the subsequent year. So that following spring and early summer, and you'd grow them in your coldest climate if you're trying to capitalize on a rubber crop because it's going to start producing fruit almost, and we were discussing earlier before recording that sometimes even before leaf break, you'll start seeing the fruit. Whereas on the main crop, that's only on the growth for that year. So as it grows and pushes out leaves, once it, once it gets more mature into the season, every leaf will support typically a fruit on, on, on most varieties of things. Yeah, the, um, the, the, the thing about uh, the Desert King okay, type uh, San Pedro's is that the, um, the brevas come early. Okay, and so in some portions of the country, Pacific the Northwest, uh, there's, there's not enough light, okay, and time for the main to actually ripen, okay, or it comes so late that they're going to have to put it in a greenhouse for it to, to do its thing. So it's popular up there, and uh, I don't grow them here because uh, the, well, I don't, uh, the, the brevas just are not, are not as intense in flavor as the main crop is. So. I have them here. You know, it's, not, it's something that we in California have such a great main crop and such good weather that the brevas are just icing on the cake in the sense yeah. that they're going to come, you know, two, three weeks, three weeks before the main crop does. So you get to enjoy a brevas crop a few weeks later, the main crop That's follows. That's right. So it's kind of like, oh, okay, it's here. Now, you know, if you've been waiting all winter and your brevas comes, you know, oh, yeah, you know, you're real happy about it. Got it. So we talked about the common fig. We talked about the San Pedro variety, but there's still two more categories of figs as well. So the remaining two categories of figs are what? 
Smyrna and the Capri figs. Okay. And what's the difference between the Smyrna and the Capri figs? Uh, the Smyrna is basically a, a female, and the uh, Capri figs are basically male. Initially, when the fig business started in California, it was Smyrna's, and they had a heck of a time getting uh, understanding, <laughs> um, you know, what they were, what they were doing in terms of, uh, of uh, whether they actually had a, a viable uh, specimen that was going to produce fruit, because the fruit kept falling off, and so it took them a number of years to figure out that number one, they needed uh, uh, they needed to pollinate or capify the Smyrna's. So they sent a bunch of people all over into the Middle East and Italy and all over the place. And they kept bringing back Capri figs. And, uh, and uh, they uh, determined that initially when they brought them back, uh, they, they'd bring them back, but it, they weren't persistent Capri figs. So the, uh, the um, wasp would die. Okay, and it took them a number of years to figure it out that there were actually three different types. And that's the Profici, and uh, Ramoni, and the Mani. And uh, I may have butchered that, the pronunciation okay. on that. But, uh, so, each one of those has, uh, has their turn, so to speak, to harbor the, the fig wasp uh, in the way that uh, it was set up in California. Those three varieties you mentioned are Capri figs, right? Yes, they are. The male figs. Mm -hmm. And the point is you got to have the male figs that will support the life cycle of the wasp. Yes. In conjunction with the female Smyrna varieties of figs. Yes. In order to have that balance of, yes. of, of, of the life cycle between the male figs. And they also got to overwinter, I think, within the male. And that's what's called a persistent Capri fig. Got okay. it. So it hangs over winter, which so they have a home because without a persistent fig, then you know if there's no figs there, then there's the wasps are dead. So on your property, do you happen to have any Capri figs here? No. So you're I, just growing the Smyrna varieties. I I have, uh, like I say, the city and the unknown pasture. Yes. <clears throat> okay, those are the two that I have. But as a whole, I do not. You know, th like I say, those are my canaries in a coal mine. They're there. They're the there to let me know what the fig situation is this year, I mean, what the wasp situation yeah, is yeah. this year. I like that. So the canary in the coal mine, he's growing two varieties of Smyrna figs on the property, and if they fruit, then that means the fig wasp is present. If they don't drop, yes, if they don't drop the figs, then, uh, yeah. But if it is supporting fruit, then you got to assume that those fig wasps are probably yes. making their way throughout the rest of the fig forest. And that's not a bad thing, because actually they do increase the flavor of the fig, uh, it's uh, when they capify it, it's, uh, and it becomes much more intense in terms of uh, the color. Yeah. Uh, because those flowers are actually then, because the inside of the fig is just flowers. True. That's, right. Just a bunch of different flowers in there, and it looks like a fruit, but it's just like a big wasp garden for flowers in there. So. So, um, again, just a couple of mentions. So the fig fruit, which I've got a couple of examples here on the floor, which we're going to dissect in just a moment. But when you open a fruit, the, the fig fruit, unlike the fruit of an apple or a peach, is basically a cavity of flowers within it. But before we get into the anatomy of the fig, um, and as Paul mentioned, and I've read this, and it applies not just to figs, but pretty much cross-pollination of a lot of fruit trees, that pollination increases flavor and, and, and in this case of figs, color as well. And if you take a pollenized fig to a non-pollenized, like common fig that has not been um, caprified. caprified by the fig wasp, you'll actually see a difference in color and when it comes to taste, there's mm -hmm. a difference in taste as well. So the fig wasp does come with something of value, even to figs that do not require pollination. Yeah, so. sometimes the the difference can be just phenomenal. I mean, you can go from um, you know, you can go from like a amberish kind of thing to something that's you know, purple. No, I've seen, sure. aside from the color dif um, differences, I've seen some that were mm -hmm. opened and the difference would be some would look dry compared to the other ones that were pollenized, look juicy. Um, the, even the, like the whole texture of the fig is different with pollination. So, um, so again, I just want to reiterate that um, pollination does come with some value in regards to flavor 
and texture um, as the seeds also add a nutty, a nutty flavor and a crunch um, that is of value when in enjoying your figs. So just wanted to share all of that with you. If you're concerned about now fig wasps entering your figs and you're truly concerned about creating that vegan fig, um, I just want to assure my friends, for example, in Chicago, Illinois, um, to New York, that they don't have anything to worry about when it comes to the fig wasp, right? No. It's, and why not? It, it can't live there. It can't live and there. It doesn't, there's no capri figs for it to house itself in. I mean, you know, if you have a common fig tree, it's going to set fruit. Okay, say you got a brebba. Okay, so you're going to have a fruit on it, uh, and then you're going to have mane on it. And back there, the, you know, you're pretty much done by November. You know, I mean, sure. you, can, you can milk it if you've got a greenhouse and you want to go through that. But after that, there are no figs left out there for the wasp to live in. So they're dead. So, so pretty much if you live in a climate where your nighttime lows are in the freezing temperatures, yeah. pretty much, um, and the colder, the more unlikely you're going to end up having fig wasps in your area. But those climates that pretty much the whole northern part of the United States, the whole central part of the United States where they get freeze, yeah. in Canada, for example, we're not going to find the fig wasp. No, it's not easy to establish the fig wasp. There's people that I know who've tried and it's not an easy thing to do. Okay. Now, in California, yeah, I could here because it's this is a natural territory for them and they're all over the place anyway. So, I could bring uh, you know, a capri figs in here Got it. and I'd be fine. But in terms of um, the people in the northeast, they've got other problems. They've got or the north, any place. Now, the the wasp could still live with a little bit of frost, but yeah, it, it, but it's got to be there to <laughs> to begin with for you sure know what I mean? so um what i want to share a little bit about like the anatomy of the fig and you can stay there i'll bring this to you um but what we can see here is that the fig has um in general if the female flowers that are in the back of the fig and in the front are the male flowers and as the fig wasp pollinates itself within there as it exits it picks up the pollen off the stamens of the male flowers exits and then works its way and again it's exiting the osteal is that hole and you can find the source here at www.palomar.edu and the point with this that I want to share and I want to sh show the anatomy of it is I've got over here if you want to come in a little closer a cutting I took off of my um, I like calling it my variegated tiger fig, also known as the panache fig, if we take off one of the figs here, like so, and these are not ripe, and most of these are not going to ripen now as we're at the end of November going in December, um, but I want to show again, here's the osteole, this is the entryway, the hole that this here is the example of what the fig wasp would look like, but the size of the fig wasp is closer to about the size of an ant. Um, maybe even smaller, maybe a little bit larger, but what's going to happen is the fig wasp will force its way into the hole of the fig and on its way in, it will more likely than not end up losing its wings in order to fit that hole. So here we are going to cut those wings off in order to help the fig wasp work its way into the osteole of the fig and then it basically enters into the fig. I'm going to share with you that as disgusting as that sounds, it's not that bad and um, Paul and I are going to explain that in just a moment. But I want to share with you what you're going to find on the inside of this beautiful and one of my favorite tasting figs is you'll see here and it's not the best example as some of the figs when you open them up, you'll actually see a cavity. Um, where the fig wasp will basically walk around within it and basically pollinate the female components of the flower. And again, as you can see on the way out, there's some evidence of some of the flowers, which would be the male with the stamens, that it would then carry its pollen as it then exits. Um, so that's just some of the anatomy um, and science behind the fig and the fig wasp. But what I want to share with you um, next is an experiment and there's two things that we discussed um, earlier um, one being one way I want to recommend and I'm hoping I've got a handful of friends that also are growing figs and I want them to um, experiment with is trying this product which is an Ivory Organics 
protection against damaging sunburn insects and rodents. And we're gonna show how this product's gonna be used in one, protecting your plants against summer sunburn, but also to protect your plants from winter sun scald as well. If you're growing plants that are um, at the edge of a particular grow zone, this will help curb the extremes and you can do some research on whitewashing and the value that brings to your plants. Um, but what we're gonna do, and this is an organic method, I'm simply gonna take my paintbrush here and if you wanna come a little closer, I wanna demonstrate on some of these smaller figs. And Paul is gonna tell us when is the best time to try to ensure that you're gonna end up with a vegan fig. But we're simply gonna take this product and apply it to the osteol, the entryway, and we're gonna reapply it pretty much every single month until the fig ripens. And the goal is that we're hopefully closing off that entryway. We're capitalizing on the fact that the product has castor cinnamon cloves. Let me actually show you the oils here. Castor cinnamon cloves, garlic, rosemary, peppermint, and spearmint. And these seven natural garden oils will hopefully repel the fig wasp from entering the osteol and, um, and possibly taking away your goal of creating a vegan fig. Paul has another idea in regards to how would we ensure the fig wasp doesn't enter my fig and creating that um, and creating that vegan fig. You, you, well, you mentioned tell something you, that about stuff it. Smells pretty good. I gotta admit. Yeah, it smells uh, good for us, but yeah, it's hopefully gonna um, repel the insects and this is specifically in this example, the fig yeah. wasp from. Yeah. Well, the problem is number one, the fig wasp is gonna go in there when it's the size of an eraser. So, you know, you're not, I mean, when it gets this size, it's already a done deal. So these are too so, big. So yeah, I've, they're way too big. So I brought, those oh. are way too big too. Okay. We're talking about the size of an eraser to a small marble. Usually they'll fall off when they're the size of a, a, a marble. Got it. They're, they're usually gone by then if they're not capified. So, um, so the know, point is, um, so the, the, the fig pollination happens Again, at the size of, you said, a racer to the size of a marble. Oh, the figs okay. that we just demonstrated with are too large. This would happen, and again, we are here now at the end of November, so I couldn't find smaller figs to right. demonstrate on. Um, but the point being, you gotta do this very early on. But otherwise, you mentioned some netting as well that could be used. So, so what bag would you recommend? If, if we didn't do the Ivor Organics, you mentioned there's a type of netting that may also work? I don't think so. Because number one, the, 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 the chance of you getting out here and hitting all these little figs at that size is, you know, let's face it. I mean, you got to be, <laughs> you're gonna have to be pretty dedicated to come out here and find netting every single netting fig. A, a, a fig the size of an, a small eraser. What if there's and, like an organza? Because you mentioned like organza would be fine enough and small enough that that may work. But is there a net? Maybe you can net the entire well, tree. The, well, no. Well, I imagine, uh, you know, but that that's going to provide its own problems. Is you know, because nets are not not much fun. But it would be so heavy, it'd probably be easier, easy to get on and get off. Uh, the primary issue with any kind of with the netting is because of the size of the fig um, when the wasp enters. For a fig wasp, it seems to me that it would be such a big uh, ordeal to do it because, you know, where are you going to tie it to? <laughs> you know, the, 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 the uh, <laughs> You're right, the fruit is so the small. Is How so, would you possibly wrap yeah, it? And then within a matter of a month, it's going to triple in size, and now you got to keep on adjusting the netting. So, yeah, so it's kind of a. It would be a big project. With the people, and again, there's going to be about a handful of people. I'm going to run this experiment and hopefully um, return the results to you by summer. Um, but the experiment would be once a month because as the fig grows, that hole is going to become exposed again. So one other important lesson when it relates to the fig wasp is even if the fig wasp enters your fig, there's really no fig wasp there by the time you go to eat it, right? No, there's, there's you know, it, uh, the, the fig itself kind of dissolves the, you know, it just basically turns into the plant or into the, the fig itself. Yeah. It's a, uh, you know, I mean, you could look at it as, it's, as if it's fertilizing, which it is, captifying the, uh, the, the uh, fig. The fig. And, uh, you know, it's what you get. It's the price you pay for the flowers. I kind of <laughs> see it like a Venus flytrap that consumes flies and that the fly pretty much offers the plant nitrogen. So as the fig wasp is going into the fig and its body gets pretty much absorbed and dissolves yeah. and there's enzymes within the figs that break down the body. So the, all that's left at the end of the day is, I like saying... Your memory. 
your memory that it was in there. Your memory, the spirit, the... <laughs> a ghost. Like there's there's really no bug in there at the, no. at, at, by the time you consume it. But you said there is a month when maybe you can find a bug if you if you were yeah, to look for it. Yeah, if you go looking for them. I mean, when they first brought them into the country back in um, uh, late 1890s, uh, they would go look for them to see if they were there because they didn't know if they were there. You know, because they were still trying to figure it out. Yeah. And uh, yeah, they were able to find some that were in there in uh, you know June. Um, around that time. So like in June you can there. open it up and maybe you then you would find a fig wasp you if, might. if it had found its way into your fig. You but might, yeah. you're talking about an unripe fig in June. But by the time the fig ripens come July, August, September, right. again, the point is the enzymes within the fig will dissolve the flesh of the fig wasp and pretty much absorb it and it just becomes part of the elements and the nutrients and the yeah. vitamins that the plant otherwise gets to benefit. You can think of it as a little bit more protein. It's a little bit more protein. <laughs> so, but that was, um, that was, but a I know that it does, you know, make some people think twice because they're looking at it and going, oh my, there's a fig wasp in there and it's been carrying on like it's 1999 <laughs> and now I'm going to eat it. Yeah. But, you know, you, you know, if nobody told you this, if nobody told you that that wasp had been in there, you wouldn't, you wouldn't notice it. That's awesome. I really appreciate this lesson. Um, so Paul's been growing on his garden dozens. I don't know. What's the number? Like how many varieties of figs do you have here? Uh, I think the last time I counted it was 58, something like that. So we've got 58 varieties of figs that are growing here. Um, research supports that there's anywhere from 700. Other research says 800. And other sources say over 1,000 varieties of figs um, that are grown worldwide. Um, but obviously even though there's a thousand varieties there are those that are the common varieties those there are those that are you know ranked as the most delicious figs those that are the most aesthetically appealing figs like the, over here the panache fig that has the variegated stripes but also <coughs> has a great taste as well um many people say it kind of has a strawberry flavor um you know to, to that fig, yeah. to that particular and fig. beautiful i mean it really is yeah so i feel like it's a win-win but for collectors. so what is your favorite fig what's your um what are your top like let's say five favorite varieties of figs that you're growing here that people should be looking for as well okay well the thing with favorites is that you number one you have to take into consideration your growing conditions okay i get uh last year i got 122 degrees for three hours and it was probably 110 for i don't know how many days so the type of fig that I'm going to grow is going to differ from the type of fig that somebody back east is going to grow. Out here I want a fig that's got a thick skin because the sun will beat on it and it won't split. And some varieties like uh, Violet de Bordeaux or Vista here, they have a thin skin. People love that. Some people don't like the, the skin at all. I love a thick skin on my, you know, and actually I like a tough skin. I, like them to where they, uh, it's almost like a external fruit leather on it. Okay. Because th those type of, of uh, figs for me will dry down on the tree. They will sit there and they will just get denser and sweeter and denser and denser until they actually get to the point where they're probably, uh, as, you know, a third the size of the fig when it's uh, full of water and moisture. So also those type of figs, I don't have to worry about getting out here and picking them because they're going to hang on the tree for that for that period of time. And with something like a thin-skinned fig, if it gets 100 some odd degrees out here, i got to get out here and i got to pick 20 pounds of them or whatever. Because they're ripen instantly in the heat. And then they sour. But your thicker skin can tolerate the heat better, is what you're saying. Yes, absolutely. And for me, those are... So when I'm looking at it for a fig that I'm going to put long term that's going to be around, this is the type of fig that I'm looking for. And of course, the flavor has to be absolutely fantastic. Um, so basically what I'm looking at is stuff like this behind me, which is Figo Preto, uh, Black Madeira, uh, Strawberry Verte also has a thick skin. Yeah, we've got this well guy over here. It dries down <laughs> really well. Um, I-258, which is this one right here. Uh, and there's a small Black Madeira right behind you there. Um, and yeah. again, I want to like contrast these to the thinner skin um, varieties, which are, you say, the Bordeaux the and Violet the Vista? The Bordeaux, the Vista. I mean, there's a number of them over in pots over there okay, okay. that uh, have thinner skins. The RDB, uh, Rondi Bordeaux, um, you know, there's a, there's, a, there's a number. 
and the value again is the thicker skin will last more days sweet on the tree and in fact you said by waiting i don't know is it days or weeks it will intensify in flavor very much so basically what's happening is it days is the or, or can you actually leave uh, it for weeks too because well, it's thicker it, it depends i mean i can leave them on the tree until i touch them and if i touch them they'll fall got it okay so how long is that I don't know. I would say 10 days, okay? Uh, the bigger risk is that uh, you leave them on and something comes, a bird comes by. Of course, you got nature. Yeah, or you got a possum or you got, you know, whatever whatever's gonna happen. Makes sense. But um, the beauty of those type of figs is, as I said, they will dehydrate on the tree. And it's not gonna be like a dried fig, okay? It's gonna be a really, really good tasting uh, thing. But the only thing is, a lot of people do not like uh, uh, the dryness of the skin on some of those um, and you don't have to let them dry down on that you can pick them off when they're nice and plump and yeah. you know full of full of moisture so um, that's pretty much uh, what I'm looking for here in terms of the figs that I want to grow because <clears throat> there's nothing worse than coming out here in my mind and pulling 20 pounds of figs that I have no clue what I'm looking for <laughs> Not only that, but the thin skin stuff will not freeze well. So, and it doesn't, I don't just, for me, it does not have the intensity of flavor that I would want to uh, preserve. So, I wind up juicing them. So, uh, and you know, it could turn into a half day project. Whereas, with the stuff like uh, the Black Madeira, the Preto, I258, uh, the uh, um, CDD uh, Roja, that stuff will just wait. Okay. Until I can get around to picking it, the longer it sits there, as far as I'm concerned, the more, more delicious. intense it is. That's awesome. Yeah, so that's, you know. Now, in some areas, if you're on the beach, um, stuff like that will do absolutely fantastic, the, the Vista, because it'll have enough time to slowly develop flavor. So thinner skin figs will do better on coastal climates? Yes. Thicker generally. skin figs, warmer, drier climates probably. Yeah. And, uh, you know, to be honest, as I mentioned previously, if I was in the fig selling business, I would probably plant an orchard of the Vista because they just put out so many figs. That's great. And the quality of the figs, I mean, you know, it's going to be better than anything you buy in the store either way. So even that one, which I consider uh, not anywhere near as intense as the ones I mentioned previously, I mean, it still beats anything you can buy in here. For sure. When it comes to figs, it's got to be off the tree exactly. to truly enjoy the taste. By the time it's at the store and it's been sitting there for even if it's a day, it's no longer the same fruit. Well, it wasn't the same fruit when it came off the tree because they have to pick them and then they have to ship them. Great and point. They, uh, the, uh, like stuff like that, the thin skin stuff. You yeah. can't ship them. They're too thin. Yeah. Well, yeah, they just... They, they'll bruise instantly, instantly and they'll turn into instantly. mush. Now, uh. this stuff here, you could, okay, because it's got that tough exterior hide on it. Got it. And, uh, you know, so that works. But uh, So when it comes to your favorites, and especially for this grow climate we're here in Simi Valley, is a thicker skin fig. Obviously, you mentioned flavor is, is a, is a flavor big factor. Flavor is, is the absolute <laughs> first thing. I think. Makes sense. Okay. And oh, uh, which one is your most popular of all the fig varieties that you've, that you've grown here that people just, like, absolutely want? Well, that would be Black Madeira KK, which is impossible. You just there's just so much demand for that thing. And KK, are you Black growing Madeira, that here? Yeah, they're, they're got, oh, so it's you can look at and see. Some people, they and I'm one of them. It's pretty much all exotic berry. That's really what I want. So exotic berries flavor is your preferred, and That's what true. you're focused most on propagating um, here uh, within yeah. the garden. Uh, yes, I do because I think that those are the. Uh, those are the ones that I really, really like. Now, so, I just want to recap. So again, so the exotic berry, and then the berries, the honey, the sugar varieties, and then the ones that have more of a caramel flavor. Mm -hmm. And obviously, there can be a blend of all of those flavors Absolutely. as well with, with, with those figs. Um, oh. And then when it comes to varieties of figs, I mentioned earlier um, before we were recording, um, Kadota figs is probably something I won't find here, right? <laughs> so um, all the figs that you're growing here are the are the varieties you won't find at the big box stores. So I won't find here. I'm assuming the Kadota. You said no. The Black Mission, the Brown Turkey, and and 
in just those common yes, ones yes. that you would find at, at some of the bigger box stores. Yeah, there'd be no point in doing this if I was going to grow this. I do grow panache because I just like the way it looks and I like the way it tastes. Yeah, it is but, unique. And you can fake. get that at the big box stores. But these are uh, these are basically co collectors' items. Um, some of them are more common collectors' items. Some of them are not. Uh, recently, there's been a uh, just a big push into striped figs. You know, well, again, they're just so ornamental from the outside. They are just the so wood beautiful. is also variegated yeah. as well, which I can share with the camera. If you want to come in a little closer, you can actually see even the wood has Stipled. some variety of color. You can see here with the yellow stripe, and then um, as it grows, you can sometimes see green, brown, and, and yellow is like the zebra pattern. You can see a little bit more of it up here. So it's kind of like more of a variegated stem compared to most varieties of figs. I'm keeping that on water as I'm gonna use that cutting to create another plant yeah. after I leave here today. They're really striking though. They really look pretty. Yeah. You know, if you put this guy, in, if you grow something like this next to a, uh, something like Crato or Black Madeira or any dark fig, yeah, yeah. you know. The it, contrast of oh, the two yeah. together. Yeah, and if they grow into each other a little bit, that makes it a little bit better. So Okay, so we talked about all the flavors of figs and the varieties that you grow here. There's close to over 50 varieties of figs you've got grown here on your property. Um, none of them are the common ones that we can find at the box store. So you've truly got your hands on some of the rare, the exotic varieties of figs um, available to um, people that are taking an interest in, in, in collecting the ones that you can't find at, at, at your local nursery store. Um, but I've noticed within your garden that there is leaves, all around the trees as again we're going into fall that you apparently have left behind and underneath that some wood chips a, a nice layer of wood chips um, can you explain a little bit about like the care and the practice and your watering practices as well um, for caring for your figs um, here in Southern California sure this has had everything from hundreds of bales of straw from the Halloween pumpkin guy makes sense okay, where you go pick them up for nothing you know I haven't got them to pay me yet to take them but I'm working on them <laughs> and then uh, the city will actually come in and uh, give me wood chips for nothing. Uh, the amazing thing is how much of this stuff gets chewed up in here. So you've already got straw that's into this well, topsoil? Well, straw is gone. And that was from last year, Halloween? Yeah. Okay, so you've added into the top layers of your garden the, you said, hundreds of yeah. bales of straw? Yeah. And that was last year Halloween. That's pretty much gone. I, gone. I don't. I don't really see much of that. Well, you know. In addition to you said, you've also got a free source. In most cities, and you should check with your city in the area that you live. But um, in my area, um, closest to home is Griffith Park, and they too, with all of the dead trees um, within the city, they'll simply grind them down and make available for free unlimited bark and compost too. By the way. Yeah, you can see how deep. This and if you want to come is. in a little closer, take a look. He's actually pulling back at the wood chips. He's at least an inch down and going down and you can see as he goes deeper, it's becoming more and more rich and brown. And obviously as it breaks down, and yeah. now that you can even see some of the air roots that okay, are working so their way. Now these roots here are coming from these trees. And this is where these roots love to grow. He's right eh, two inches down, three inches down. Yeah. They're gonna be right where they can get plenty of aeration. And, uh, and all the nutrients are right there, and I'm sure it. the earthworms oh, and the beneficial oh, yeah. bacteria and, and you, everything I mean, else. You can is... just see the quality of this stuff, you know. And of course, we've got all the, the you know the micro hood in there doing their thing. And it's sustainable again yeah. as well compared to if you're coming in with compost and just keep on yeah, enriching with yes. compost, it's going to break down and disappear it, quickly. This stuff here, well, the wood chips. Okay, now I'm not talking about the heavy duty stuff like this. Okay. Yeah. But this type of stuff here, that's. The bugs eat it. I mean, the micro herd eats the stuff in a year to 18 months. It's gone. How often are you bringing wood chips into the garden? Every, I would say, uh, every 18 months. Uh, um, and then how about watering practice? <laughs> What's your watering practice like? Well, um, you know, there's not much watering going on here for the figs. Uh, basically, I sit back and I watch and see what the rainy season did. And uh, if I got uh, 12 inches, I'm not worried about it. I might hit it once um, when the figs are forming up, when the main crop is forming up. Um, you know, I may hit it and give it another two inches. Now, if, if I only got seven inches, 
then I'm going to try to see to it that I got at least, you know, I'm going to have to add another five. So how many and inches, I do like in a year? This, with so, this stuff with the soaker hose. Soaker hose. Yeah. So in a year, how many inches are you looking at? It looks like you're counting the number of inches <laughs> per, per I year, I want to right? see 12. 12 inches in minimum. a year. Minimum. Okay, that's what I'd like to see. And that'll take care of my figs. Okay, we're not talking about, you know, the uh, stone fruit and stuff. That is, you're going to have to water. So this past summer, I know in my area it was 117 <laughs> degrees, and you said over here is 120. 122, yeah. 122 degrees here in Simi Valley, um, and then a lot of days that week that were 110 degrees. You said. Yeah. And then what was your watering practice? Let's say that week. None. No water. When it was 120 degrees out. Too late. You didn't water before. Well, yeah. I mean, I watered in, uh, you know. Probably 10, you know, as soon as I saw that we were going to be up there, I, you know, I, I hit it once, maybe twice. I mean, you know, this is soaker hose, let it run for uh, 12 hours. But that's about it, because basically... And, and you're talking about, is, a, about a week before the heat wave came. Well, whenever I, whenever I know it's going to come. Now, you got to be kind of careful, because if you water too much, uh, you're going to blow your figs up. Right? You're right. The the figs will actually yeah. um, retain too much moisture yeah. and possibly explode, and that's where you see the fig cracking right. as well. And this, what I've got here is just basically a big sponge down there. It is. Stuff. It's retaining the moisture. Yeah. It's also keeping the ground. Yeah. I heard several degrees cooler in the summer, mm -hmm. and in the winter it also offers insulation, keeping the roots and warmer. And it does. And a lot of this material, the organic material, has been drugged down, you know, by earthworms or what shredded, yeah. you know, and so improving the entire soil yeah. biology as well. Exactly. So. Now, most of the root is, um, you know, you saw where it is. Yeah. Okay, so most of the feeder roots are going to be in that area. Uh, and probably no more than, I want to say 18 inches, but I think that's even generous. So you you're know. saying most of the life is, like you just said, within the first 18 inches, which the I've heard that from roots, other sources. Yeah, so another helpful tip um, I was hoping you could share is when it comes to your potted figs and how to care for your potted plants compared to I'm assuming, and in my experience, it's a lot easier when you've got your figs in the ground. Another important consideration is as the fig matures within the container, um, there's some risks to be aware of with watering practice and especially as we're going to temperature extremes again with those high heats. Right, right. And um, do you want to share what some of those are? Sure. Um, well, primarily, um, if you're root bound and you're in a high heat situation, it's going to be very difficult to keep enough water on the thing because if you're watering from the top, you're, there's no media left in a root-bound pot. So there's no media left to suck up the moisture. So you're just basically pouring it right through the roots. So um, <clears throat> what I do is uh, if I do not have irrigation up in that particular part of the yard, is I will let it sit in um, Something like in a moisture. saucer or something. In a saucer. And then I'll, you know, let it dry down a bit. And you can feel this by the weight of the pot. I mean, when it's dry, it's really light. And then I'll just, you know, repeat as needed. It's, uh, <clears throat> during the summer, you can keep these things uh, sitting in, uh, in saucers as long as you don't let them swim, okay? You don't want root rot to, to, uh, to, uh, to overcome the plant. So, but, so continuous water situation is also detrimental yeah, to the health of yeah. the plant as they'll become, as you just said, root rot being, yes. the moisture will start rotting the soil media as well and, and, and start, well, start rotting the roots. And the roots. Yeah. yeah. So, I mean, but there's a delicate balance here. It's basically, figs like to be, uh, in my opinion, they like to be uh, well hydrated, then they like to be dried out, well hydrated, you know, dried out in a pot that's the way that I like to grow them. Yeah. And it's also the way that I can uh, water stress some of the fruit so that, uh, you know, it's not a really hydrated, I, you know, it's where the moisture has been uh, taken out and the flavors are condensed in a pot. That's kind of difficult to do. It's much easier to do it in ground. I know one of the um, growers, Tom Spellman, Dave Wilson Nursery, uh, largest distributor of bare root fruit trees in the country, he kind of explains like the watering practice and add to this if you want um, that you should be watering thoroughly but allowing the plant to dry between waterings but never bone dry yeah. and, and and that's kind of like the science that you need to understand and it's going to be different springtime versus summertime versus wintertime um, being 
again, depending on temperature and amount of sun and, and how active the plant is with growth and fruit versus if it's in a dormant state. So another important question I get often is in regards to winterizing your fig trees. And this applies not just to your fig trees, but also your peaches, your plums, your apricots, any, even your roses and ornamentals. If you're growing your plants in a zone that's at the cusp of your grow zone, you can better protect it through a gardening concept known as whitewashing. And you can do so with a product like this. And Ivory Organics makes this three-in-one plant guard, which offers protection from damaging in the summer sunburn and the winter sun scald in addition to insects and rodents. And then Ivory Organics also makes another product, um, which is the Blue Label Whitewash, which is simply an oil-free version of the same product. This one here has the added oils of, again, castor, cinnamon, cloves, garlic, peppermint, rosemary, and spearmint. These seven natural oils will offer the tree protection from damaging insects and rodents. And if you come in a little closer while you're still here, you'll notice that where it was pruned last, the pith of figs in particular is very soft and will collapse and become a perfect entryway for beetles and termites. If you go with the product and seal it, we're going to better protect the integrity of the wood and that exposed surface, again, from pests as well as disease. And then we can simply now brush on the product. And what we're doing is we're simply clothing the fig with the three-in-one plant guard. And with the added oils, again, protection from insects and rodents, it'll protect the stem from girdling rodents as well. And I know before we um, discussed this, you mentioned that you had some rodent issues here in this garden as well, right? <laughs> yes. <laughs> the, uh, <clears throat> the back area over there is where I do most of the up potting and uh, it's a shaded area, so the number ones wind up over there. And I had, uh, I don't know, I probably had 20 uh, Figo Pretos, Black Madeiras, <laughs> just black Madeira complex figs that the rats just ate the tops off of. They just ate the greens off of, like this stuff right here. They so they went for the most expensive of your fig oh, varieties. Oh yeah, they, they didn't touch the more, uh, you know, pedestrian <laughs> the stuff. They, stuff. They, went for it, they went for it, and uh, as a consequence, I, that, uh, it set me back about a year on those guys. I had to hold them for a year. Wow. <clears throat> because they did not break. So they ate, they ate the top parts of the fig off, yeah. you're saying, the, yeah. like the greener part, but they obviously left the, the bottom thank part God, and hopefully it rooted so it was yeah. able to grow back. Yeah, thank God they didn't girdle it, uh, but they were after the top uh, four or five butts, and they just chewed them, chewed them down, and uh, I didn't notice it for, a, and I did it within a week. And uh, so, yes, that was uh, very Got distressing. It. So with girdling, just to quickly let you know, is where um, it's predominantly rodents, whether they be rats, it could be mice, it could be rabbits, it could be squirrels. And it's especially more so a winter phenomenon, even though I know in San Francisco it's a year-round issue with rats in particular, where they'll basically chew their way all the way around the base of the tree, usually, um, to basically get to the underlying saps and the sugars. And that basically keeps the animal alive when there is a insufficiency of seeds and fruits and other things to eat. So they'll basically strip the bark and damage the underlying mm -hmm. cambium tissues. And without that cambium layer, the plant will go into shock and more likely than not, it'll shorten, it'll maybe die that year or just shorten the lifespan of, of, the, of the tree as well by girdling it. And I know a lot of foresters will kill a tree mm -hmm. by girdling it mechanically um, to basically remove trees. Instead of removing the entire tree, they'll just girdle it and kill the tree that way so yeah once the cambion is gone uh, the, the tree is d dead at the base yeah the whole communication between yeah you're right the roots can still be alive and maybe send some sucker yeah, growth if you, out yeah if the top um, is, uh, but the top of the tree is doomed yeah. pretty you much. you can girdle the top branches for air layering you can girdle them there interrupt the uh, yeah, yeah you know the, the hormone flow to form roots to create the roots and stuff. but once you girdle it at the base you're you're in big trouble you've messed up the the life and the health of that tree um in regards to varieties of figs, I've got a list here of over 50 varieties of figs that you've got growing here. Um, and you shared with me that if people are interested in getting their hands on your figs, they can find them at... Um, um, so if you wanna get your hands on close to 50 plus varieties of figs that Paul's got available, they might not be there all simultaneously as he's um, propagating, you know, probably some of these 50 varieties more so one particular year compared to the uh, another year. 
Um, but I've got a list of 50 varieties that he's grown in recent years that I'm gonna make available right here on the screen. Um, and you can find his figs at figbid.com. And I'm gonna put that link to the website right here as well as embed it within the comments down below. And username Tyro, you'll know you'll be getting the fig cuttings and the fig um, plants, which you predominantly make available as cuttings or as one gallon size? Uh, as cuttings and uh, sometimes as one gallons too. So it makes them available in both ways. You're gonna be looking for username Tyro, again, T-Y-R-O, and it's important, we had this discussion before we started recording, that you know where you're getting your figs from because everybody's scientific methods in regards to how they label and how they um, group and how they um, manage and where they even source, where they start off with their original figs um, is different for some growers as compared to the way Paul grows his figs and makes them available to others on eBay. Um, among other sources, uh, there's Amazon and, and, and a whole bunch of other social sites where you can find things, but um, I'm proud to share in talking with you and learning from you that FigBid is a safer zone for making sure that you're getting specifically the varieties that you're investing question, in yes. compared to these other sites that are more unregulated compared to FigBid, which is, I would say, better regulated because they're wanting to make sure that the sellers there are selling the true varieties yes. that you're basically paying for. And it's a costly investment, even if it's $20, let's say is kind of like the cheapest gallon plan. I don't know if you can get them for less than that, but I know most of the box stores, if you get it to get your hands on a fig would cost about $25 for a single um, common variety fig. And the true investment happens only when you take it home and start planting it. Once you plant it, once you fertilize it, once you care for it, once you water it, once you wait that first year, once you wait that second year, and now you're enjoying hopefully the fig that you paid for <laughs> and not the wrong variety of fig, and now having to contemplate whether or not you remove the fig to go and now plant the one you really wanted, the one you wanted to initially invest in. So, yeah. um, But these are the costs. It's not that initial investment, but when it comes to cost, some figs can cost as much as how much. And you, you threw out numbers. I didn't even know figs can cost that oh, much. Well, you know. But let's say for a three gallon, five gallon container, how well, high can a fig cost? Well, you know, to begin with, there's a shipping issue. Okay, most people don't want to ship a three gallon or a five gallon. So most of the stuff's going to be in number one. So a one gallon container. Or in a tree pot. What's the most expensive one gallon container then? Uh, that I've seen? Uh, God, I don't know. Probably, I think it was 600 bucks. So, so a fig plant can cost as much as six and seven hundred dollars. Um, you mentioned also earlier that a five gallon black Madeira. A uh, fifteen gallon black Madeira. There's a guy who's <laughs> wants fifteen hundred dollars for it delivered. So fifteen hundred dollars so, for a fifteen gallon. Yeah, so um, yeah. so these prices can become quite radical. Uh, yeah. And um, so figs like tulips have a variety of price ranges. Um, Orchids, get, really. You know, that's if you really think about it. And orchids, yeah. you're right. The the more common ones will, will be going for less. The ones that are more rare and more exotic, you can expect to pay a premium for, but you'll be rewarded with these flavors that, as I was also explaining off camera, when it comes to figs, if I had a fig tree with a thousand figs, you can guarantee that every single fig will be eaten by my family of four, with most of them probably going, you know, to me. Yeah. Um, but. You well, just can't have enough of them when they taste good and they're and, delicious. You know, you don't have to pay a lot of money for figs. Like, yeah, so, I mean, you don't have to spend a lot of money for a quality fig. This here is a strawberry verte, okay? And, uh, and this is an excellent quality fig. This is this is my wife's favorite fig, and quite frankly, it's always, you know, right up there in the top five, and usually number two. And, uh, you know, these cuttings here, are, you know, they're four bucks a piece, you know? And to, to rank this, this fig up with the quality of something like this or a black Madeira, which you're going to pay significantly more for, and uh, you know, they're, and these are terrible to root, incidentally, for me. So something like this is a, is a very nice fig, and you know, there's lots of the other thing. That's great. Um, I also want to share, in regards to forums, if you're looking for a forum for communicating, a few of mine that I've um, found quite informative are um, figs and things and fig addiction and what the fig are three Facebook pages where you can um, communicate and share some of um, your questions and, and gain some in, you know some knowledge as well um, but some of Paul's that he recommended and shared with me are 
ourfigs.com and figsforfun.com, which I'll again make available down below on the screen for you to write down and do some more research and, and learn more uh, from what these sites have to offer as well as I'll embed them in the comments below. Um, so you can reference those and, um, and gain all of the knowledge and learn more about the varieties and learn more about um, what figs you're growing or what figs you'd want to introduce into um, your home garden as well. So if you've enjoyed this educational moment brought to you by Ivory Organics, be sure to give us a thumbs up and most importantly by subscribing down below, you'll be connected to this and all of our other educational videos and also don't forget to hit that push bell notification to get notification as soon as these educational moments get released. Um, again, thank you Paul for yes. having, having us. <laughs> um, we've learned so much more about figs and hoping you did as well. Uh, feel free to write us some comments down below, I'm also going to include Paul's email address um, down below for you guys to directly write him. Um, he'll answer any of your questions as well as myself and we'll work together to hopefully answer all of your fake questions. And again, from all of us here at Ivory Organics, wishing you all happy gardening. Because it's horizontal, it gets a lot of sun. And as you can see, if you come a little closer, you can see that it's kind of burned. So this would be really cool. Oh, that actually shows. Wait, before you paint that, let's see the cracks. Trust me, there's enough of it on here. <clears throat> here we go. So now you can coat it. Yeah, see? this is coming off here. Yeah, yeah. that's yeah. all sunburned. Yeah. Yeah, but all of that below was all cracked right. from. Yeah, where I'm going now, yeah, all this stuff. Sunburn. You can see how, this is all third year wood, most of this, right? Yeah. So right in here is also some more. Like, I call it second and third degree burns. Yeah. yeah right, right there. here. Uh -huh. Where the bark's damaged and probably the underlying cambium tissues are also suffering. Yeah. As well. All the way down. All, well, wherever you can it's, see on the top portion of this, of this trail. And right in here. Like right here, you can see that the... Uh, so it's all of the sun exposed. Like right there, yeah. Surfaces. Just gets big cracks in it. Perfect. You know what? This this stuff smells good, <laughs> doesn't it? Yeah, yeah, it does.